when Paul says, men of Athens, I see that you are in every way very religious. I can almost hear like the preachers that read that passage just spitting out the word religious. <laughs> like, I see you're very religious, religious, but you don't know Christ. When in fact, what Paul is actually doing here is saying, I see that you're grabbing at something. I see that you're, you, you know that there's something right? Let me show you what that something is. Because uh, the fact of the matter is, is we've been talking about these concentric cir circles all the way out. Anybody who believes in something bigger and greater than themselves, that they should, that, that should govern them beyond their own ego and intellect, we have something in common with that person as Catholics. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another We're Not Satisfied Until You're Satisfied episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny. We are with the Coming Home Network. All three of us were evangelical Christians of some stripe or another before we ended up in the Catholic Church. Ken and Kenny were pastors, uh, but our whole <laughs> world is kind of wrapped up in the idea of how do we help others who are like us, who have questions that might be leading them uh, towards the Catholic Church. Uh, if that's you, then please reach out to us at chnetwork.org. We'd love to talk to you. We have an online community where you can plug in as well. That is community.chnetwork.org. And of course, all this made possible by generous partners in mission uh, who help us out and uh, make all of our resources free to anyone who asks. Uh, and if you want to join that group of partners in mission, please go to chnetwork.org slash donate. Ken and Kenny, how are you? Doing well. I'm great. Good to see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Good yeah, to see you, you guys. You guys too. So we've been going through the four marks of the church. Uh, in the Nicene Creed, we say that the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. We spent one episode on the word one, one on the word holy, and now <laughs> we're actually going to have to end up doing a second episode episode on the word Catholic. <laughs> so Ken Hensley, where do we have to pick up? We're where actually, do we leave off? We're actually going to do three episodes on the word Catholic because there's just so much to oh, say. Oh, doggone it. Yeah. And so- uh, The 17 marks <laughs> of the church. Yes. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm, 10 of which are the word Catholic. I'm going to try to summarize where we've come very, very briefly because there's so much material for us to cover today and to talk about. And it's material that's quite controversial to, to many. Uh, so here we go. All right. Mm -hmm. So in our last episode last week then- we focused on the meaning of the word Catholic or the phrase Catholic Church. And we took a little trip down memory lane. We went back in history to the earliest use of these words and phrases in the writings of the Apostolic Fathers and those who followed them. And what we discovered there was a consistent, a repeated pattern. None of them took the words Catholic or Catholic Church to simply mean everyone who believes in Jesus. After all, the early Gnostics would have said they believed in Jesus. The early Marcionites would have said that. Everyone would have said that. No, rather the Catholic Church, this we learned last week in our last episode, from the beginning referred to a particular church. It was something visible. It was the people of God gathered around their bishop with, and now to quote from paragraph 830 of the Catechism, a correct and complete confession of faith, full sacramental life, and ordained ministry in apostolic succession. Okay, that was last week. That was the essential meaning. If you want to hear more, go back and listen to that episode. Today, we're going to move forward to address the question, okay, so who belongs to the Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. And this is where things get wild, okay? Um, <laughs> is, it only, is it only those who are formal members, members of the Catholic Church? What about non-Catholic Christians, those who believe in Christ? Are they, in some sense, members of the Catholic Church? What about those of the Jewish faith? What about Muslims? What about those who adhere to other world religions? Can they ever, in any sense, be said to belong to the Catholic Church? And if so, what in the world is meant by the Catholic teaching that outside the Church there is no salvation? These are the questions that we're going to at least begin to address 
here today. Okay, so let me roll with the first and the easiest, really. Who belongs to the Catholic Church? Paragraph 836, I will read from the Catechism. All men are called to this Catholic unity of the people of God, and to it, in different ways, belong or are ordered. They're at least ordered if they don't belong. The Catholic faithful, others who believe in Christ, and finally, all mankind called by God's grace to salvation. So notice quickly that everyone is called to the Catholic unity of the people of God, the Catechism teaches. And I would say, I'm adding to this just briefly, because of our creation in the image and likeness of God, created to be God's children, all of us, because of the reconciliation of all things brought about by our Lord Jesus, everyone, literally everyone, is called to the Catholic unity of the people of God. Everyone, by creation, by reconciliation, by redemption, is ordered to that unity. That is, this is the natural end of every person. But who belongs to the Catholic Church? This is the question being asked. And first, again, the easiest would be those who have formally joined themselves to the Catholic Church. This, if you will, if we're going to think in terms of concentric circles, this is the innermost concentric circle. Those who have formally joined themselves to the Catholic Church. And we read in paragraph 837 about this group. Fully incorporated into the society of the Church are those who, possessing the Spirit of Christ, accept all the means of salvation given to the Church together with her entire organization, and who, by the bonds constituted by the profession of faith, the sacraments, ecclesiastical government, and communion, reminds me of everything we taught last week, are joined in the visible structure of the Church of Christ, who rules her through the Supreme Pontiff and the bishops. And then, important, comes a key proviso. Even though incorporated into the church, one who does not, however, persevere in charity is not saved. He remains indeed in the bosom of the church, but in body, not in heart. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can speak of faithful Catholics then as the inner circle of those who truly belong to the Catholic Church. These have been fully incorporated into the society of the Catholic Church. They accept the teachings of the Catholic Church. They participate in the sacramental life of the Church. They, they, they live under the leadership and the rule of ordained leadership um, in apostolic succession, the leadership <clears throat> of the Church. They persevere in faith and charity. This is the inner circle. So I, I would put it this way. If we want to think of those who belong to the Church as a series of concentric circles, this is the inner circle the inner circle. So then, okay, Kenny, moving out from this, um, or if you have a comment about this, but moving out from this, who would constitute the second concentric circle of those who could said who, who could be said to belong to the Catholic Church? Very good. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, this is uh, for the three of us on, on camera here, the th three of us on screen here, this next piece is really important. Uh, because it has to do with our own experience as non-Catholic Christians and the way that the Catholic Church thought about us as followers of Jesus before we ever um, thought about being members of the Catholic Church from the Catholic Church's perspective. Let me read um, paragraph 838, which speaks to this, this next concentric circle, and I'll share a couple of thoughts about belonging here. Paragraph 838 says this, The church knows that she is joined in many ways to the baptized who are honored by the name of Christian, but do not profess the Catholic faith in its entirety or have not preserved unity or communion under the successor of Peter. Those who believe in Christ and have been properly baptized are put in a certain, although imperfect, communion with the Catholic Church. With the Orthodox churches, this communion is so profound that it lacks little to attain 
the fullness that would permit a common celebration of the Lord's Eucharist. In order to help understand what's going on here, um, we're going to find out a lot about the Catholic mind in this, um, the, the Catholic way of thinking about things in this episode, this concept of universality and, and what that really means. And what the Catholic Church does and what she's doing here and what she's saying here is that there is nothing outside of the claims of Jesus in the universe. In other words, we can say in a, in a semantic range of understanding the word belong, that in a sense, Jesus is saying to everything that exists, that belongs to me. And he lays claim to it. Now, in terms of how we human beings respond to his claims on our life, well, there's, there's a variety of possibilities there. But still, Jesus is saying to everyone in the human race, in a sense, you belong to me and you belong with me. And as Christians, by virtue, as the Catechism says, of our baptism, that um, sacrament of initiation into the faith of Jesus, into the life of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have been brought into a kind of union with the Catholic Church. The Church, though, speaks of it as an imperfect union. Not all of the um, pieces line up. And Ken, I was sharing with you, you know, as we were preparing for this uh, episode, some some nautical ideas for understanding this, some nautical terms. Uh, before I was um, a pastor, I was in the Navy for six years and happened to float around the ocean a little bit on a, a couple of aircraft carriers, going out to sea and coming back in. And you learn terms like mooring lines and housers, uh, bollards, rings, and cleats, docks, piers, and quays. Well, what is all that? Well, that's ways in which a vessel can be connected to the pier or connected to land. And what the Catholic impulse is, and we're going to see it a lot in this episode, the Catholic impulse is if you're on the ship, you look for the bollards, rings, and cleats. If you're, <laughs> you look for the points where you can tie on. Uh, if you're, you look for the dock, the pier, or the quay. But if you're on the pier side, you look for the mooring lines and the housers. In other words, you try to find those things which allow you to really connect and draw you together. That is the Catholic impulse. And so the Catholic Church would claim us and, and say, you belong to us by virtue of your baptism. Now, as you said in the introduction, which was a summary of last week, there are a lot of other layers of that to really fully moor uh, that ship to the pier or vice versa that have to be connected. And that's really a kind of what our lives and what our ministry is about at the Coming Home Network. But I'll just stop there. That That's the heart of what the Catholic Church is saying to non-Catholic Christians, that you belong with the Catholic Church, and we'll do all that we can to draw you as fully into that communion as we can. Any thoughts from you, Matt? Yeah, I mean, just to, to tie into uh, how we as an apostolate think about ourselves and think about other people— you know, there are some people who look at uh, even the title of our apostolate, the Coming Home Network, and on the more kind of indifferentist side, they might say, "Well, why would you call the Catholic Church home? Why isn't that so arrogant to to say that this would be like where all people should be? Like, why can't people be good where they are?" Mm -hmm. And then on the more sort of strident and rigorous side, people would say, "What do you mean a journey? Like, just come on, you're either in or you're out, <laughs> right? Yeah. There is no." There's no, there's no in between. Uh, whereas um, how we look at this is we're trying to look at it the way that the church looks at this, uh, meaning that we are probably nicer. I mean, despite the fact that we're our number one goal is to bring people towards the Catholic Church, we're probably nicer to non-Catholics than almost any <laughs> any apostle on the planet because this is like so important to us, right? We yeah, want to right. see where there's those you know mooring po points are you know where those uh lines are that we can tie uh the whole of of catholicity is looking around and seeing what piece of this does my friend get 
and how can I complete the puzzle? Yeah. Um, and, and of course, this, this applies in the question of, of Christians who are not Catholic, but it applies, as we're going to see down the road, with, with people who believe in, in all kinds of things besides Christianity as well. Yeah, right. we're always asking the question, what light is there? What light do we see? Kenny, I think that you described it so well in what you just said. You know, the thing about Navy and, you know, Hulehauser and Cletus and all the people you mentioned, whatever, uh, about... <laughs> <laughs> My mind was just floating off as you were throwing all these words at me that I've never heard before. I mean, I've heard of cleats before on the football field. It's my favorite field, law firm, by the way. Uh, the, the baseball field. But the thing that came to my mind when you were describing that is uh, par paragraphs 817 through 819 of the Catechism that I, went, I wind up quoting more often than any other paragraphs in the Catechism to the many to the many, many Protestant pastors that I deal with and that I that I work with. And what it essentially says, my paraphrase, is that, you know, the Reformation was a terrible thing that happened. It was a terrible split that occurred. But then it says, and I'm almost this is almost word for word, it says, we do not hold those accountable though, who are born now into these communions that 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 uh, exist because of the fragmentation of the Reformation, that is the Baptist churches, Presbyterian, all these Protestant churches, those who um, are born into them and are raised in the faith mm -hmm. of Christ, and we receive mm -hmm. them with respect and affection as brothers. And then it goes on, in fact, to say that there are many aspects of the truth mm -hmm. that lie outside the confines of the Catholic Church, the life of faith, yeah. love for the Word of God, the work of the Spirit. So. Anyway, I just want to say amen to what you just said. This really is the experience of our lives, and this yeah. is what I talk about a lot in the ministry I do here yeah. at the Coming Home Network. Ken, let me share one more thought on that before you jump into the next paragraph. This is an, an analogy that might make a lot of sense. Um, I, I, you know, I happen to have been given up at birth uh, for adoption, and I met my biological family when I was 24 mm. years old. And so in that sense, you could say I was a separated brethren, you know, from my family yeah. of origin, from my family of birth. And I happen to have a very deep and close and ever-growing relationship with one of my brothers. And even before I was in a relationship with him, like I am now, we go on vacation together, we, we stay in each other's homes, our families spend a lot of time together. In a sense, there were a lot of things about me that belonged to him, like our DNA, our common um, uh, parentage on my mother's side, lots of things, the way we look, um, just just so many things about us where you could say, I belong to that family, even though I had been separated from them because of sin early on. And that's really the heart of the catechism toward um, non-Catholic Christians is that there there have been separations that have been caused by human sinfulness, and yet the church will not reject her motherhood, her, her parentage of those children who have been separated from her for a variety of reasons. Okay, now with paragraph 839, we are going to begin the section of the catechism that's titled the church and non-Christians. And now this is still under the rubric of, or the question, who belongs to the Catholic Church? And so if the innermost concentric circle would be those formally joined, and then out from that, the second concentric circle would be those who believe in Jesus Christ, but are not Catholic, um, then where, where do we go beyond that, all right? The Catechism begins this section with the relationship of the church with the Jewish people, can those of the Jewish faith in any sense be considered as belonging to the Catholic Church is the question. Okay, now let, let me read and just listen carefully, and then I'm going to make some comments, and uh, I'll throw it to you guys when I'm done, but maybe a few minutes, all right? So mm -hmm. sit back. 839. Those who have not yet received the gospel are related related to the people of God in various ways. The relationship of the church with the Jewish people. When she delves into her own mystery, the church, the people of God in the new covenant, discovers her link with the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. 
The Jewish faith, unlike other non-Christian religions, is already a response to God's revelation in the Old Covenant. To the Jews, and then quoting Paul, to the Jews belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, the Messiah. For the gifts and call of God are irrevocable. And then 840. And when one considers the future, God's people of the old covenant and the new people of God, the new covenant, tend towards similar goals, expectation of the coming or the return of the Messiah. But one waits, that is, the people of the new covenant, await the return of the Messiah who died and rose from the dead and is recognized as Lord and Son of God. The other, the those of the Jewish faith, await the coming of a Messiah whose features remain hidden till the end of time. And the latter waiting, the latter waiting, is accompanied by the drama of not knowing or misunderstanding Christ Jesus. Okay. When I read this, you guys, I wrote about 50 pages of material down thoughts. The temptation, <laughs> the temptation, the temptation to run off in a thousand directions was considerable. All right. But I, I'm going yeah. to strongly, I'm going to strongly resist that temptation. And I, I do want to announce to those listening that very soon we're going to do a series in which we are going to do a real deep dive into this whole issue of the relationship of the old covenant to the new covenant, the relationship of Israel and the church, the tribulation, the rapture, the millennium, dispensationalism. We're going to go deep into all of these subjects, okay? And so what I want to do here, because this section is part of a is part of a whole, it's not a standalone episode, is I want to simply focus on what these two paragraphs actually say and what they do not say. Okay, first, what these two paragraphs say. And here's how I sum it up. On the most basic level, what the catechism here wants to remind us of is the natural closeness that we as Christians possess with those of the Jewish faith. I mean, we have so much in terms of a common background in our acceptance of the revelation of God from the Old Testament. I mean, the people of Israel, as the as the catechism says there, were the first to receive the word of God. With them, God entered into covenant. God gave them his promises. The patriarchs came from the, uh, the people of Israel. Um, God gave them his law, and through them, the Messiah was promised to come into the world, a light to the Gentiles. We share so much background, is what the Catechism is wanting to say here. We not only share a similar background, we share, I mean, so much background, but we share a similar future and goals in the sense that we look to a Messiah that has come already, that has died, that has risen, and that we seek and we hope to return again. Those of the Jewish faith look to a Messiah yet to come. Okay? So there is this natural closeness between Christianity and the Jewish faith, a closeness that exceeds the closeness that we would have with other non-Christian religions. Okay, this is, is what the Catechism affirms. Now to what the Catechism does not affirm, what the Catechism is not saying. And I'll, I'll put it as a, as a couple of questions. Do these paragraphs of the Catechism, do they imply that Jews belong to the Catholic Church simply by being Jews? And I just want to say, you know, categorically, not in the least. It's speaking of those who embrace the revelation of God in the Old Covenant those who embrace the covenant of God, it's those who love God and who trust him. That's who it's referring to here. And the call of God, as you and I know, it's always been the call to repentance and faith and the obedience that flows from faith. I mean, never in scripture from the beginning to the end, never is it intimated that anyone, Jews, Edomites, you know, Amorites, whoever, that they somehow would have it made with God simply because of their genetic code, simply because of their race. Never. And after all, what did John the Baptist say when the Jewish leaders came to him at the Jordan River? He said this, bear fruit, 
speaking to the Jewish leaders at the time, bear fruit that befits repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise from these stones children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree that therefore does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I mean, this applies to the Jewish people, but it applies to all people. It applies to everyone. It applies to the bishops and the Pope himself, okay? So these paragraphs are not implying that somehow Jews have it made with God uh, merely by the fact that they are descendants of Abraham, okay? So if these paragraphs are not implying that, let's move forward a step then. Is the catechism implying here that Jews who are faithful to the Old Covenant on that basis alone belong to the Catholic Church? And this is a more interesting question. And the answer to this question is a lot more um, subtle. And I begin by saying, is the catechism implying that Jews who are faithful then to the Old Covenant on that basis alone belong to the Catholic Church? And I will say not exactly. After all, again, notice with me the final part of paragraph 340, where the Catechism speaks of faithful Jews who look forward to the Messiah and do not know, or who misunderstand that Jesus is their Messiah. I read that and I thought, why does the Catechism think to include those words? They look forward to the Messiah, a Messiah they do not know. And they don't know that Jesus was their Messiah, or they misunderstand. Okay, putting this together, you guys, what the Catechism t seems to be saying to me in these two paragraphs is something more like this. Those of the Jewish faithful who embrace the promises of the Old Covenant, who embrace the Word of God revealed in the Old Covenant, covenant and through the Old Testament, and who look forward to the coming of the Messiah, and who do not know, or who, who misunderstand that Jesus Christ is their Messiah, these may belong, they may be said to belong to the Catholic Church without knowing it, without understanding it. Now, let me back this up before I ask you to jump in and either contradict me or support or say what you want to say, okay? I, I think that this is confirmed by a number of things that the church has said recently. For instance, here's something that Pope St. John Paul II wrote in his 1985 Notes on the Correct Way to Present the Jews and Judaism. This is what he said. The church and Judaism, the church and Judaism cannot be seen as two parable, parallel ways of salvation. The church must witness to Christ as the Redeemer of of all. Okay? Okay, hear that again. The church and Judaism cannot be seen as two parallel ways of salvation. The church must witness to Christ as the Redeemer for all. Okay, and then one more quote here. This is um, from Pope Francis. In 2015, Pope Francis authorized the publication of a document that was titled, The Gifts and Calling of God are Irrevocable, a Reflection on Theological Questions Pertaining to Catholic-Jewish Relations on the Occasion of the 50th Anniversary of Nostra Aetate, the Vatican II document. Now, in this document, we read this, and I'm quoting now, There cannot be different paths to God's salvation. The theory that there may be two different paths to salvation, the Jewish path without Christ, and the path with Christ would in fact danger the foundations of Christian faith. Okay, putting this all together, I think that the key idea here, which is contained subtly in those final words of, uh, of the second paragraph I read, that is where it talks about the Jews looking forward to a Messiah who do not know or misunderstand. I think that the key idea to understanding this is the idea that's going to come out in spades in one of the last paragraphs that I read later, later on in this, in this um, 
episode. That is 847, where we read, Those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace try in their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, those two may achieve eternal salvation. And those two, I will say, may be considered as belonging to the Catholic Church. Gentlemen, I throw it at the ball into your court. So I just, yeah, I just want to make a very clear and definitive uh, statement of, of where I stand on this question. Uh, the question of our observant Jews uh, who honor the Old Covenant part of the Catholic Church is actually the same answer that I have to the question, uh, why did God choose the Jews in the first place and not another people? Um, and it is who has known the the mind of the Lord that they may instruct him. <laughs> like I got no idea how this all works, and that's kind of uh, the church leaves a little room for mystery here. Uh, actually, not just a little room, a lot of room for mystery here. And uh, I am very hesitant to say things that the church doesn't say when it comes to these questions. Um, I'm actually hesitant to say things where the church doesn't say things on a lot of questions, but this is one, one of them. Yeah. And what I'll, what I'll say here is I go back to the mooring line analogy, many of which I see in the paragraphs regarding the church's relationship to Jews and especially those who belong to the church is that there are many cleats and mooring lines here and where those can connect the Catholic Church wants to connect them. And also because we see uh, as, as the church, we, we understand ourselves as this living organism, okay? Much like a tree or a plant, uh, but more like a body. We will not cut off parts of ourselves, nor dislocate parts of ourselves, nor um, divorce ourselves from some um, you know, past aspect of our development as the people of God, as though that never existed before, that it doesn't matter. And what the catechism is doing here is saying, look, God's been at this a long time, and you can go back all the way to the beginning of Scripture, all through salvation history, and all of this, if you will, belongs to God and how he is saving the world. So that's as much as I'll say. Uh, about that piece of it. Yeah, I don't know if I have anything more to say. Go, go ahead, Matt. Well, I was just going to really reiterate the idea that we're going with like sort of concentric circles. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we start, the church starts and goes in an order of where we have the most mooring lines. Yes. Right. And yeah, uh, yes. where it's, yeah. the, the mooring lines aren't as clear or where there aren't as many, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just readily accessible points of contact. And, yeah. uh, and, and with with the Jewish people, there are more than just about anybody else that we're going to talk about today. Absolutely, uh, there's just a lot. Well, that's the first Absolutely point. Absolutely right. That's the first point that I made. That the those two paragraphs in the Catechism were wanting to emphasize how much closeness there is in terms of our origin, in terms of our past, and in terms of our goals and our expectations for the future. So it's definitely mm -hmm. saying that there is a lot of um, overlap. There are many mooring lines. Um, mm -hmm. having said that though, there's a bottom line, no one without faith and the obedience that flows from faith. I mean, I, I think about the first paragraph I read about the first concentric circle, that is those who formally belong to the church. And it ends up saying, yep. it, it, it ends up saying even there that those who do not persevere in faith and the obedience of faith or in love will not see eternal life. Yeah, yeah. This and is that's in that continuity with the principle we see throughout the Old Testament, right? And even yeah. in the words of John the Baptist, you can be in the people of Israel in body, but not in heart, <laughs> right? I mean, this is yeah. this is a principle that is echoed throughout um, the Jewish faith that we as Christians are building upon. Um, mm -hmm. That you know, yeah, 
we can i mean well, how many how many psalms are there about offering sacrifice but your heart not being where it's supposed to be being in the room but not being yeah who is where your heart is supposed to be or he yeah. or he, he is a true jew who is not one outwardly but one who is inwardly circumcision is of the heart all these things yeah. you know like like i said the temptation to go off in a million directions is there but i will simply yeah. say this when Paul struggles with this exact question in Romans chapter 9, his heart's breaking because not more of his Jewish brethren have accepted the message of Christ. His answer is to say, hey, listen, God made it clear that there would only be a remnant. And that remnant was the 12 disciples around Jesus, the group that followed him. That remnant was the 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and that remnant was Jewish to the core. Mary, Joseph, the first disciples, the apostles, all of them, that remnant was Jewish to the core. But then Paul makes it clear that from that remnant are being added all those of any nation that will come. Mm. So um, faith and obedience are still at the root. And Yeah, that's good, a good segue there, Ken, to the next section. And Hopefully, if you're listening to this, what you can hear is part of the Catholic mind, the Catholic impulse with respect to this concept of belonging, is the Catholic Church's self-understanding that she is the vessel through which God is announcing salvation to the world and bringing that about, you know, in concrete ways. And so, we, as as the Church of Jesus, have to look at everything under the purview of the Lordship of Jesus and say, well, it all belongs to him, and he's reconciling all things in heaven and on earth to himself, to the head, and to his body, which is the church. And so we can't, as the people of God, look at anything in creation or any group of people as, quote, God-forsaken people. Uh, rather, these are all human beings that God is bringing back to himself um, through a, uh, through you know a variety of different backgrounds. So we come here to paragraph 841, 42, and 43, and we find first uh, Muslims, then non-Christian religions, and then other religions. <laughs> and so let me read these paragraphs, and I'll share quite a bit here um, that hopefully will help you know bring some clarity to the Catholic way of thinking about these things. Beginning with paragraph. 841, which says, the church's relationship with the Muslims. The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place, amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, that is, that there's one God. And together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge, on the last day. So again, see the mooring lines there. It isn't that there's complete synthesis, complete uh, a total agreement, but where the church can tie off or tie on, she will in order to draw together. All right, so then 842, the church's bond with non-Christian religions is, in the first place, the common origin and end of the human race which would be God himself, or the, the fact that there is a God. All nations form but one community. This is so because all stem from the one stock which God created to people the entire earth, and also because all share a common destiny, namely God. His providence, evident goodness, and saving designs extend to all against the day when the elect are gathered together in the holy city. And then finally, paragraph 843. The Catholic Church recognizes, please listen to this, recognizes in other religions that search among shadows and images for the God who is unknown yet near, since he gives life and breath and all things and wants all men to be saved. Now we'll come back to this, but if you're a Bible guy or a Bible girl, your, your Acts 17 bell is ringing right there. Let me move on, though. Thus, the church considers all goodness and truth found in these religions as a preparation for the gospel 
and given by him who enlightens all men that they may at length have life. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes to un- unpack the big ideas here. What we discover in these, <laughs> in this whole section really, but these paragraphs for sure, is the Catholic mind, the Catholic mindset with respect to the whole world. Like, what does the Catholic say to the world? I go back to something written uh, in the at the beginning of the second century through Saint Justin Martyr, who himself was a philosopher before he became a Christian, and so he spent a lot of time before before he converted to the faith interacting with the philosophy of his day. And here's what he says in his second apology. Now, this begins to carve out the tributary in the Catholic mind for what now we see in front of us in the Catechism. Here's what St. Justin Martyr says in the 13th chapter of his second apology. Again, this is written during St. Justin's life, who, who lived from the year about the year 100 to 165 AD. He says this, For I myself, when I discovered the wicked disguises which the evil spirits had thrown around the divine doctrines of the Christians, to turn aside others from joining them, I laughed both at those who framed these falsehoods, and at the disguise itself, and at popular opinion, and I confess that I both boast and with all my strength strive to be found a Christian. Not because the teachings of Plato are different from those of Christ, but because they are not in all respects similar, as neither are those of others, Stoics and poets and historians. For each man spoke well in proportion to the share he had of the spermatic word, seeing what was related to it. But they who contradict themselves on the more important points appear not to have possessed the heavenly wisdom and the knowledge which cannot be spoken against. Now here's the key says St. Justin. Whatever things were rightly said among men are the property of us Christians. For next to God we worship and love the word who is from the unbegotten and ineffable God, since also he became man for our sakes, that becoming a partaker of our sufferings, he might also bring us healing. For all the writers were able to see realities darkly through the sowing of the implanted word that was in them, for the seed and imitation impacted according to capacity is one thing, and quite another is the thing itself, of which there is the participation and imitation according to the grace which is from him. Close quote. I think as I read this of a quote that I heard from another convert, somebody I listen to fairly regularly. His name is William C. Michael, and he's uh, uh, the founder of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. And in a lecture that he gave online entitled, Did the Pagan Gods and Goddesses Really Exist? (laughs) Shocking title there. He says this, and this this really connects to what St. Justin Martyr says. He says this, as Catholics, we should ignore the errors of the pagans. We should, however, pay attention to their successes, because what is really amazing about them is not that they got things wrong. That is understandable. What is amazing is how much they got right. That is what we should admire, not how much they got right without having access to the sources that we take for granted. This is exactly what St. Justin is saying. He's like, I I ran around like a philosopher and I've heard it all, including the attacks on Christianity, but I'm a Christian and I found light. And that light ultimately led me to Christ. And he says, whatever uh, they got right properly belongs to us. Now, commenting on this is another Christian voice who I love, and that's Mike Aquilina. And he says of this quote by St. Justin Martyr, quote, St. Justin looked into the mind of Plato and found a Christian born centuries before his time. 
Speaking with Romans, speaking with Greeks, speaking with Jews, he sought the good in his adversaries' best ideas and showed that the good belonged properly to Christ and Christians. This, guys, has to do with this word that we're looking at in the catechism right now, this mark of the church, which is that she is Catholic. That's our word. That is like our, that's on the, all of our jerseys, Catholic. Catholicity or universality. This comes from this, these two words. Uh, uh, the, uh, universal comes from unum, which is one, and vertere, which is to change, to, to bring everything or change everything or order everything to one. This is what the Catholic Church is doing. It is looking inside of everything and saying, is there one thing, even one thing about you that properly belongs to us? And if so, we found ourselves a cleat to which we can tie our mooring line. Or you may have a mooring line you can tie onto our cleat. And even if it's just one thing, we will use it to pull toward you, to, to grasp you, and to draw you to ourselves until you come into fullness. Let me just share one more thought here with you. Um, I, I'm reading this great book now by um, Pope Benedict XVI on the Church Fathers. And in the chapter that he writes on Clement of Alexandria, he notes that Clement takes what St. Justin had begun, which is this looking for ways to tie on, as it were, to the other ideas in the world. And he takes it further. In a sense, he helps to develop this, this Catholic way of seeing how we can join uh, you know, the world to the saving, uh, uh, the saving way of Jesus through his church. And he says this about uh, St. Clement of Alexandria. He says, we know that St. Paul at the Areopagus in Athens, where Clement was born, had made the first attempt at dialogue with Greek philosophy, and by and large had failed. But they said to him, we will hear you again. Clement now takes up this dialogue and en ennobles it to the maximum in the Greek philosophical tradition. And then uh, Pope Benedict says, as my venerable predecessor John Paul II wrote in his encyclical Fide et Ratio, Clement of Alexandria understood philosophy as instruction which prepared for Christian faith. And in fact, Clement reached the point of maintaining that God gave philosophy to the Greeks as their own testament. For him, the Greek philosophical tradition, almost like the law for the Jews, was a sphere of revelation. They were two streams which flowed ultimately to the Logos himself. The final idea, uh, coming right back to St. Justin, where St. Justin acknowledges that within the mindset of people who don't um, properly understand God as he's revealed in Christ, that there are lies, there are shadows, there is darkness, there are untruths, but sprinkled into them are also points of light, illumination, the true voice of God, which scripture says has gone out to the whole world. And some of these things have properly and truly been grasped by other groups of people. And the Catholic Church looks at all of that and says, hey, that is properly housed in the Catholic Church. And in this sense, you, by virtue of that aspect of what you believe, belong to us because that belongs to us. So we're going to get into this next time we talk about our mission and how this informs our mission. But our orientation toward all of the religions of the world Jews, Muslims, the other non-Christian religions, and really all people, is to find these points of connection wherever they may be. And the Catholic mind is to say, you belong with us. Let us draw you as close as you are willing to come. And that's as much as oh, I'll say yeah. there. 
you talked about the bells of Acts chapter 17 ringing, and they certainly are ringing in everything you said there. I mean, I think about Paul, St. Paul's sermon in the city of Athens. He comes to a city that is described as a city filled with idols. That's what it says, mm -hmm. a city full yes. of idols. And he says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed mm -hmm. along, as I passed along, I observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. And he goes on to explain to them that the God who created the whole world and created all people, he is not, he's not served as though he needed anything. He's not, he's not, you don't have to build him temples and all that. He, and he created all people and he put them th throughout the world so that they would grope toward him and find him, even though he's not far from any one of them. It, it's the same thing you're saying here, you know, this, it's all these points of light to where, you know, th this is a totally different way. When I was a Baptist pastor, I remember we would have, you know, discussions often like, what about the, what about the child raised in the jungles of Papua New Guinea? who's never mm -hmm. heard a word about Jesus Christ, knows nothing about that. And people would line up and strongly say, sorry, no hope. You know, uh, or if God wants him saved, a missionary will go there and will <laughs> preach the gospel to him and he will understand it and accept Jesus as personal Lord and Savior or, or, or forget about it. You know, and I never felt like I could buy that, but I didn't really know what to buy, what, you know, what 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 to think and and i do, and i believe that this catholic perspective is just so much more encompassing of reality and you mm -hmm. go to justin martyr and you go all the way to the philosophers you know but yeah it applies to everyone anyway that's all i think i would say to that matt anything yeah, well i gotta i gotta bracket some of the stuff or we could do like five more episodes. You said what three episodes on the word Catholic. We might have to do like that, that 20 episode run on this word. Uh, <laughs> the, the one thing that I'll start with is that in regard to these points of light, where is their light? And can you mentioned this earlier before? Um, there's this principle out there that it is very, very difficult for someone to be a hundred percent right about everything. It was damn near impossible for anybody to be a hundred percent wrong about everything <laughs> right? right this is yeah, this exactly. is just reality um you know, i did a uh, an episode of coming home network presents with rod bennett and jim papandrea uh recently who you know uh for being very well read and written on the church fathers but they're also sci-fi geeks uh and i was talking to, to them and we did an episode on on science fiction and catholicism and uh, rod mentioned that he had been to a conference of priests somewhere in tennessee and uh he asked one of these young priests he's like why is it that so many young priests are like into science fiction and like fantasy stuff like it seems like there's a lot of quote unquote nerdy nerdy guys coming out of seminary these days and he asked one of these guys like why do you think that is and the, the seminarian said well i think it's the idea of the spermatic word <laughs> like the idea that in even science fiction and fantasy you see like a grasp of truth right yeah. even mm -hmm, in like mm -hmm. isaac asimov and carl sagan and you know people who are you know, maybe don't have any kind of anything. They're still trying to grasp at something. They're they're trying to to aim it at at something somehow, um, and somewhere. And you, so I mean, not to get this too far down the science fiction road, but you know, George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars, was very into Joseph Campbell's whole hero with a thousand faces question. Um, why is it that these same themes keep on popping up in all these cultures around the world? Um, what is it about that? And the cynical person on the progressive secular side of, you know, kind of like pure materialist atheist philosophy might say, well, that's because everybody just steals everybody's ideas and there's no real truth. But the Catholic side would say, you guys are all like, get a piece of it. We got the whole thing in here. <laughs> we got the everything that you're aiming for, everything that you're trying to explain through myth. And, and well, as the catechism says, you know, like shadow, mm -hmm. uh, we have we have the thing that you're seeing in the wall on Plato's cave. We've got the reality where we are. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say about this, you know, the Acts 17 bell coming off, uh, you know, and, and just dinging really loudly. I read that passage very differently as an evangelical Christian who, as uh, Hensley, you were saying, you know, 
if you don't hear me preach the gospel, you don't accept it on my terms, as far as I know, you're going to hell. Uh, when Paul says, men of Athens, I see that you are in every way very religious. I can almost hear like the preachers that read that passage just spitting out the word religious. <laughs> like, I see you're very religious, religious, but you don't know Christ. When in fact, what Paul is actually doing here is saying, I see that you're grabbing at something. I see that you're, you, you know that there's something, right? Let me show you what that something is. Because uh, the fact of the matter is, is we've been talking about these concentric cir circles all the way out. Anybody who believes in something bigger and greater than themselves, that they should, that, that should govern them beyond their own ego and intellect, we have something in common with that person as Catholics. Anybody, anybody who wants to be better than they feel like they have the, the power within them, inside themselves to be, anybody who thinks that the universe is bigger than their own drives and passions and wants to do something about that, we have something in common with that person. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking back, Matt, to the series you and I did on evangelizing atheists and agnostics. And even there, you know, the point that was being made continually is that because every person is the creation of God and the image and likeness of God, that we all have certain things written into our, or etched into our bones, as it were. For instance, moral law, you know, the fact that right and wrong are real things and that they exist. The fact that human beings have value. Um, the fact that human beings should have rights, inalienable rights to life, liberty, and, and, and yet none of these things can be accounted for on the basis of uh, material particles interacting according to strict chemical, <laughs> physical laws. But everyone believes them. And so there, there are points of contact. I'm just kind of weaving this onto what you just said, Matt. There are points of contact everywhere, points of contact everywhere. Now, let me do this, though. Okay, I, I view this episode and the passages we've read are kind of cumulative to where by the time we get down near the end, we can almost just read them and they just sort of add color to what yes. we've all, already seen without having to be yes. co commented on. And that's what I want to do here in paragraphs 844 and 845. It's as though the catechism uh, backs up a step to describe the plight of fallen mankind and to explain maybe more, more fully God's plan to unite all in the one Catholic church. This is what it says. 844. In their religious behavior, however, men also display the limits and errors that disfigure the image of God in them. Very often deceived by the evil one, men have become vain in their reasonings and have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And now the bells of Romans chapter one are ringing off in, in your brains. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exchange the truth of God for a lie and serve the creature rather than the creator or else living and dying in this world without God, they have exposed, they are exposed to ultimate despair. 845 to reunite all his children scattered and led astray by sin man worshiping idols of all kinds the father willed to call the whole of humanity together into his son's church the church is the place where humanity must rediscover its unity and salvation the church is the world reconciled she is that bark which in the in the full sail of the lord's cross by the breath of the Holy Spirit, navigates safely in this world. According to another image dear to the church fathers, she, that is the church, is prefigured by Noah's ark, which alone saves from the flood. Mm -hmm. Again, we have hints here, Rome, Romans chapter 1, in the rearview mirror. We have hints of Acts chapter 17. Um, all of that here, just restating what we've seen. And I would say setting us up pretty much exactly for asking the question outside the church there is no salvation what in the world does that mean in, in fact kenny i'll just throw this to you and you say whatever you want to say about it but it it almost feels to me that having read these paragraphs and having you know at least basically elucidated their content and their meaning it's almost like this these last paragraphs outside the church there is no salvation is a sort of a conclusion it's a sort of a, it is it's sort of a recap 
go ahead. And again, what we're dealing with here is it's possibly something that a person watching this episode might be feeling. Well, guys, what are you saying? Are is is Catholicism universalist in its understanding of salvation? Like just doesn't really matter what you believe, everyone's going to be saved. Do you believe in universalism? And uh, like, like, what's going on here? And again, we have this word "universal." It's our word. It, it's the word "Catholic." These are synonyms for for each other in two different languages, Greek and and Latin. What the Catechism is doing right here is stepping in when you feel the impulse to ask that question. So, are you teaching universalism? The answer to the question is here in. 846, it says this. How are we to understand this affirmation, then, often repeated by the church fathers, reformulated positively? It means that all salvation comes from Christ the head through the church, which is his body. Basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. The one Christ is the mediator and the way of salvation. He is present to us in his body, which is the church. There's that body ecclesiology that we've unpacked before. He himself explicitly asserted the necessity of faith and baptism, and thereby affirmed at the same time the necessity of the church which men enter through baptism as through a door. Hence, they could not be saved who, this, this word is really important, they could not be saved who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse either to enter it or remain in it. Here is the theme of just outright rebellion against light. And, and so you have these sort of two images here of humanity in response to light. Some people love the darkness and hate the light, okay? Those people, uh, th there's a whole, whole bunch said in Scripture about them. But then there's another kind of person who sees through a glass darkly, who sees men but as trees, who has a little bit of light but can't see everything, who is walking in as much light as they have. Those two groups of people, their orientation toward God is very different. One thing that the Catechism says is inescapable. Apart from Jesus and his body, the church in the world, there's no way for the human race to be saved. Or as the Catechism puts it, positively speaking. All salvation comes from Christ the head through the church, which is his body. Now, we have to unpack how that looks, particularly when we talk about the section on mission. But the church, simply put, is the means by which God is announcing salvation to the world and bringing all people from every kind of background imaginable into his household. Uh, I'll end with this because Ken and, and Matt, you'll have some things to say, but this section of the catechism goes all the way back to the very first paragraph of the catechism itself. And here's what that says, the first half of paragraph one in the catechism. God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. There's the mooring lines image, cleats, bollards, and mooring lines. Listen, he calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. So there are those points of light that each person has, you know, more or less of those in their life, and they're responding to those. 
And here's the final thing that I want to say about paragraph one. He calls together all men scattered and divided by sin into the unity of his family, the church. And so that is where the saved humanity will ultimately be. And outside of that saved humanity, there won't be any saved humanity. All of history, all of salvation history is moving toward the unity of all humans who will be saved into the church of Jesus. Well, I actually think um, for me, Kenny, I think that I'll let Matt go first because I think that my best response to what you just elucidated there is to read the final two paragraphs that I'm going to be reading. So, <laughs> and then I'll mention something. Go ahead, Matt, if you have something. I'd say go ahead because the, the comment that I have only makes sense after you've read this next paragraph. No, you go ahead. <laughs> No, uh, I must uh, decrease. Yeah, after you. <laughs> okay. Final. Uh, okay. D just listen to these and you'll understand why I s said what I said. Mm -hmm. Paragraphs 847 and 48 conclude the section of the catechism, answering the question, who belongs to the Catholic Church? And I think it's the perfect commentary on what you just said, Kenny. This affirmation th that, that there is no salvation outside the church is not aimed at those who, through no fault of their own, do not know Christ and his church. And, and then quoting from the Vatican II document, Lumen Gentium, those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace, try in their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience. Those two may achieve eternal salvation. Although in ways known to himself, God can lead those who through no fault of their own are ignorant of the gospel to that faith without which it is impossible to please him, the church still has the obligation and also the sacred right to evangelize all men. And we're, we're going to look at that under the, the next section on the mission of this Catholic church. But I, I just think it's so important that the Catechism chooses to end this section with these strong words. So, again, uh, God creating, I'm just, God creating every person in his image and likeness, every person at some level in their heart of hearts, knowing something about this God, knowing something about right and wrong, knowing something about so much. And what it is saying here so clearly is that, you know, even though salvation comes through Christ and through his church, we are not teaching that anybody in the world who is saved has to know all of that. I mean, again, mm -hmm. I, I, I think of the man that Jesus described into the temple who was in the corner of the temple and all he could do, he couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. All he could do was beat on his chest and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and Jesus said, that man went home justified. Now, people don't do it in their own power. This passage says, moved by grace. It's God's, right. or you use the word calling, uh, Kenny. God is calling out to everyone. God's grace graciously reaching out to everyone and drawing everyone. And those who are moved by that grace do their best to seek God according to the dictates of their conscience and what they have learned and all that. These two may achieve eternal salvation. So the ones who don't would be described in the words above, that those strong words, they could not be saved who knowing. Now that's a word we could spend a while unpacking that. You know, what mm -hmm. does that mean? Yes, we who, could. Knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse to enter it or to remain in it. Go ahead, Matt. That's my that's my final word on this wonderful passage from the Catechism. So I uh, I know that there are people who read the they could not be saved who knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ would refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. I don't take that as a harsh pronouncement on my enemies. I take that as a harsh pronouncement on myself because I'm a sinner, <laughs> right? Because every time I choose the other thing, I am walking outside of the, of the light. 
I take that as a much harsher pronouncement on myself than I do on other people. Uh, but this this no salvation outside the Catholic Church combined with the this affirmation is not aimed at those who just don't know through no fault of their own. I think there's actually a lot of great hope in that. I have, uh, and I, I'm sure that you all do too, and I'm sure many of the people watching this do too, many friends who have outright rejected Christianity or faith in general. And if you drill down, what they've actually rejected is a horrible experience they had at church. Yeah. Whatever sure. that is. Yep. And if you, in some ways, they still have some admiration for Jesus, but they're so cynical because of the experience they had in some congregation that it's all mixed up in their heads. I have yeah. tons of friends like this, tons of them who have deconstructed it into uh, a, a hybrid of something or nothing at all. Um, and it's just a mix. I don't know that I can point to them and read their soul and say, this person has rejected the truth of Jesus Christ. I feel like I can just say this person was hurt. And I don't, I don't know. I, I know that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. That's all I can say. But I have an obligation to help them know who Christ really is. Um, so I, I, I mean, I would say that kind of to, is the way that I think Good. of these two things together. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes. And I have kind of one thought to, to wrap things up, but I'm, I'm curious as to how you all think of, on that particular question. I, I think my, my final thought here, guys, before we wrap up is just, I, I use this phrase a lot, this Catholic impulse and, and Protestant impulse. What, what I want, hopefully, the, the viewer to detect here is the Catholic impulse. The Catholic impulse is not a posture of protest or dissonance or to push away. That is the, not the heart to exclude. But this idea of, of, of universality, of Catholicity, is to look for everything that can stick and stick to it. Everything that can be drawn in and draw it in. Everything that can be grasped and grasp. Everything that can, you can say yes to, say yes to it. Anyone that you can connect to, to connect to them in whatever way you can. And that really is in a sense, the heart behind the incarnation of Jesus into the world, that, that God takes on human flesh. He becomes as much like us as it is possible to become and joins us and enters into solidarity with us in order that he might draw us up into the very life of God uh, himself. And so this is the heart of Catholicity, and this is the heart of our orientation toward the whole world. Good. Yeah. And I just want to say, uh, Matt, I agree with what you just said. You were asking our response to that. I just want to say that I agree with that. Um, this, um, you know, there, you know, is someone actually rejecting the truth or has someone been hurt or has someone not understood the truth? Again, I mean, back right. to back back to the beginning. You know, a young child being raised in a faithful Jewish family that reads the old, what we call the Old Testament, um, that mm -hmm. loves God, that seeks to do God's will, and either does not know that the Messiah, their Messiah, has come, or has been simply taught from the time they were born. Parents as well, the grandparents have simply been taught. Look, there's one thing on earth you cannot be ever. <laughs> and that is a Christian. You know, you can, right. you, you may be able to become a Buddhist or even an atheist, but you cannot become a Christian. Christ is not the Messiah. And, and they've grown up with that burden. Or th the Muslim child being raised, you know, with a similar, with similar, you know, back to the positive side. I, I just totally agree. The light of Christ shining in the world in so many ways. And it's our job to reach out and to, to perceive the goodness of that and to grasp it and hold it and use our, our, our Huell Howard, Cletus, whatever it was again, <laughs> and, and draw, you know, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And that's what we are about. Amen. And that's where I think this phrase from paragraph 845 sums up the whole thing. The church is the world reconciled. Mm -hmm. so uh, and good. you could almost... Ooh take that sentence that phrase and emphasize a different mm -hmm. section of it mm -hmm. with every way that you say it 
The church is the world reconciled. The church is the world reconciled, right? The church is the world reconciled. Or even just to say the church is the world reconciled. Like, it is mm -hmm. such a rich concept that mm -hmm. any way you phrase it, how, whatever emphasis you put on whatever syllable, <laughs> the truth comes through. The Catholic way of thinking is that if we're talking about moorings, yes, we want to throw that line out to you wherever you are on your life raft anywhere. But we're not just going to drag you behind the boat for all eternity. We want to get you on the boat. Amen. We want to get you on the boat. So that's all I got. So if I had on. a hanky, I'd wave it right here. Sign us off. Uh, <laughs> all right. Sign I us think out, I will. <laughs> Well, if you want to read, uh, well, actually, you can't. I mean, if you want to read the catechism, just go back, and, you know, pause on the screens. But go through. We've been hanging out in the 800s of the catechism. We've been doing a series on the church for uh, several episodes. You can find all those episodes at chnetwork.org. There's a tab under resources uh, where you can click over to On the Journey. You can also uh, support our work. We'd be very grateful if you decided to be a partner in mission. We try and make our resources free, and we're only able to do that because of our generous partners in mission. You can join them at chnetwork.org slash donate. Again, thank you so much for your time. Ken Hensley, Kenny Burchard, good talking to you. We'll chat again soon. Goodbye, gentlemen. God bless you guys. Probably talk see to you ya. tomorrow, actually. We'll see you tomorrow.